there we are great welcome everyone to the final um in our virtual um visit series to saints and holy places organized by the orthodox fellowship of saint john the baptist i'm margaret haig and i'm the current chair of the fellowship um, if you'd like to find out more about the fellowship, please do um, check our website. Um, I'll be putting the, um, uh, the address in the chat um, shortly, um, but it's forerunner.org.uk. This series has focused on some of the important saints and feasts of this winter season. We've already visited St Nicholas and, and Bari, the city of Bari in Italy, St Spiridon and the island of Corfu, St. Herman of Alaska and Spruce Island, the season of the Nativity of Christ and the feasts surrounding it in Bethlehem, the Mother of God and Walsingham, and tonight is our last session on uh, St. Seraphim of Sarov and Deveyavor. We really do hope this um, will be an inspiring session for you and perhaps lead to um, a pilgrimage um, in the future. This session is being recorded, as I mentioned already, um, so please do um, share the link with your friends um, or watch it again if you like um, when you um, get that. I'll be sending out a follow-up um, email, a final email for the series um, after tonight. And so you'll get the link again um, to where all the re recordings are held. So we're pleased to offer these sessions for free, but we are um, having a charitable collection for two charities in the Holy Land, both education charities. They are the Tiber Education Fund and the Bethany Orthodox, uh, um, the Bethany Orthodox uh, School for Girls. Sorry, I'm getting my tongue in a twist. Um, I'm going to put um, the um, information in the chat. If you would like to make a donation and you haven't already, um, there is a link to PayPal. Um, if you have problems with PayPal, do email us um, and let us know and we will send you an alternative um, way to um, make payment. And if you would like to, if you've donated, um, Mother Maria at the Community of the Resurrection in Bethany has offered um, to receive a list of names for commemoration. If you'd like to do that, if you could make your donation and send your list of names to our email address, which is in the chat, um, if you send those by tomorrow, um, that would be really helpful and we will collate them and send them all in one go um, to Mother Maria so that she's not inundated with emails from us. Um, so, finally to tonight's presentation, I'm really pleased to welcome Alevtina Tanu to present to us this evening. I've known her since we both attended an Orthodox youth camp a few years ago, not that long ago, a few years ago. Alevtina was born in Moscow into a priestly family in the uh, 1980s, so she lived through the end of the Soviet times and experienced the revival of orthodoxy in Russia from the beginning. She has studied theology, languages and Byzantine studies in Moscow, London and Thessaloniki. At the moment she works as a translator and a Greek language teacher, and she's been visiting Deveyavo since the 90s, almost from the time it was given back to the church. So I'm going to ask um, Alevtina to start shortly. Just a reminder that we will encourage you to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So you can put those into the chat um, as you think of them or put them at the end. And then um, I also recommend that you go on to speaker view um, so that when uh, Alevtina shares her presentation, you will be able to see it at the biggest um, resolution and hopefully you can see it clearly. So without further ado, please, um, I welcome Alevtina. I invite you to unmute yourself and start sharing your presentation. Hello, everyone. And nice to meet you. Uh, now I will try sharing my screen. There were a few technical problems before the start of the show. Just a second, sorry. Um, sorry, one second. So here's my presentation. And now I should be able to share.
it is a little bit slow. Sorry. So here is what Postelianin, a Russian religious writer, writes about Saint Seraphim and gives his portrait. The more you think about him, the more light and joy enters your soul, as if you return back to the best days of your childhood and youth. Everything unclean, sad and dark is washed out of your soul when Saint Seraphim shines before you. In the face of every evil in the world, in the face of every misfortune of your life, you can recall, and what about Saint Seraphim? People around may be horrible to each other, but you will not say that the life is evil when you think of Saint Seraphim. Perhaps people are weak and their best intentions are not realized, but you can never say that the truth is unattainable when you remember Saint Seraphim. It becomes easier to bear every trouble and the light starts shining on the dark days when you cry out Saint Seraphim. I will give you a short outline of his life, speak about some of his teachings, touch upon his canonization and the Soviet period, and finish with the description of the Diveva Monastery today. Prohor, Saint Seraphim name in the world, was born in the middle of the 18th century in the city of Kursk. His life from the very beginning was marked by miracles. Um, when he was around seven, he fell from a very high bell tower and wasn't injured to the great surprise and joy of his mother. Uh, now on the screen, there should be the bell tower of the cathedral he fell from. I don't know whether it shows or not because I'm not sure whether it's working well. It's, it's it's not at the moment, but let's hope it catches up. Well, um, it still exists and you can see an icon of Saint Seraphim there in honor of this event. Uh, maybe there is a way that I can share the screen in another way, because I think without the slideshow, <laughs> the talk won't be the same at all. Okay, if you want to um, stop sharing and then we'll try again. Try again, yes. I'm really sorry because it was, it was working. Um, perhaps while you do that, um, I will um, sing the Triparian, which I've forgotten. Yes, to do, yes, yes. I think we should have started so with it. Yes, I'm really sorry. Maybe that's the reason why it's not working. So um, today I'm having some screen issues as well, so I can't share my screen with the Triparian on it. Um, but hopefully, while Alev Tina um, uh, gets back on track, we um, can listen to you and uh, pray uh, together to Saint Seraphim. <clears throat> Thou didst love Christ from thy youth, O all blessed one, and ardently desiring to work for him alone. Thou didst struggle in the wilderness with constant prayer and labor, and having acquired love for Christ with compunction of heart. Thou didst prove to be the beloved favourite of the Mother of God. Wherefore we cry to thee, save us by thy prayers, O Seraphim, our Holy Father. Okay, let's try this version.
and it doesn't move either, right? Uh, very slowly, it does. Yes, slowly, yeah. Very slowly. Well, <laughs> anyway, I will try to solve this problem while, while telling you the story. <laughs> So he fell from this bell tower, which was very, very high, but he wasn't injured and he was seven years old. Some years later, he became ill and the doctors couldn't heal him. Uh, but the mother of God visited him in a vision and told him that she would heal him. On the following day, there was a procession with the icon of the Kursk root icon of the mother of God. And it rained. And this is why the procession took another route. And it happened to pass through the, through the yard of the house of Prohor. And so his mother took him out of the house. He venerated the icon and then he was healed. From his youth, Prohor loved church services and had very kind heart and humble character. From very, very young age, he wanted to become a monk. And, uh, and uh, having received, a, oh, so maybe, maybe I can share it like that. It's not the best way. But still, you can see this bell tower with the icon of Saint Seraphim, where he fell from. And here is the Kursk, the, the Kursk root icon of the Mother of God that probably some of you have venerated. Now it is uh, kept in the United States of, of America, but it was also brought to London. So it must be too familiar to some of you. So having received a blessing from an experienced monk and elder in Kiev and a blessing from his mother who gave him a cross which he kept with him all his life, he entered the monastery of Sarov in 1778. And here you can see little icons where his mother found him, uh, found him alive after his fall from the bell tower then you can see Prohor uh, venerating the Kursk root icon of the mother of God. And then you can see the, his mother blessing him with a cross. And then the elder in Kiev give him a blessing to go to the monastery in Sarov. And uh, on this and on the following slide, uh, the, uh, sorry, it plays a little bit. Uh, there is a a route he made uh, from the journey he made from Kursk to Kiev to get the blessing of this elder, then back to Kursk, and then from Kursk to Sarov. Saint Seraphim was a novice for eight years at the Sarov monastery. At some point, he became very ill again, and he was this time he was ill with dropsy. And again, the mother of God appeared to him in a vision and healed him. All in all, during his lifetime, Saint Seraphim had 12 visions of the mother of God. In 1786, he was tonsured a monk. So eight years after uh, entering the monastery. And on these little icons, you can see the mother of God healing him uh, from dropsy, then his tonsure, and then him being a deacon and seeing a vision. Generally, he was such a prayerful man that he was uh, seeing a lot of visions, not just the mother of God. Saint Seraphim loved solitude and whenever he had time, he would go to the nearby forest and spend time there in prayer. A year after he became a priest, he received a blessing 
to go and live in a hermitage in the forest. And so here you can see uh, what uh, these forests, uh, the Saro forests look like. And um, unfortunately, and then he built a little hermitage from he, for himself. Unfortunately, none of his hermitages have survived to this day. He worked in his vegetable garden there, prayed and received no visitors. To protect his solitude, he even blocked the way to his hermitage with, with logs of wood. As you read Saint Seraphim's life, you see that his ascetic endeavors become harder and harder. Some monks tried to live with him, but nobody could stand the focused and harsh life Saint Seraphim was leading. At some point, Saint Seraphim decided to pray on the rock, kneeling on the rock near his hermitage, and he did so for 100 days and nights, and nobody knew about this at the time. Only later, he revealed it to some people close to him. Actually, very little is known about all the years St. Seraphim spent in solitude. We know only a few facts. Once he was attacked by robbers who thought he kept treasure in his wooden house. So they beat him almost to death. As a result, his spine was damaged badly. And hence, his famous depictions with the hunched back. But this event didn't prevent him from going to his hermitage again when he recovered a little, where he started another spiritual feat, silence. He stopped talking completely and it lasted for a few years. A brother from the monastery would bring him food and St. Seraphim, in order to indicate what to bring him the following week, would put on the table a piece of cabbage or a piece of potato. This, and this was his only food. There was even a period when he ate only boiled wild weed. While he lived in the forest, he was seen more than once feeding a bear. When Saint Seraphim returned to his monastery, he went into seclusion and even Holy Communion was brought to him. So he even didn't go out to the church. In 1815, he somehow eased his seclusion, opened the door of his cell, started going to church and receiving very few people. But it, it was only 10 years later in 1825 when he began serving people as an elder, advising and consulting them. It is amazing to realize that Saint Seraphim, who is so famous in the Orthodox world nowadays, spent most of his life in solitude away from people. The information we have about him is drawn mainly from the last eight years of his life when he received people daily, up to 2,000 people came to him each day. And it was at this period when he founded a new Deveva community, monastic community. And these are the pictures of uh, Deveva and of the nuns, but uh, they are from the beginning of the 20th century, not, not, not uh, 1825 when it was founded. Another astonishing fact is that he himself had been to Deveva only once when he was a deacon. The Sarov Monastery was 12 kilometers away from Deveva, and there was a link between Devevo's old community and the Sarov monks. So Saint Seraphim accompanied the head of his monastery on some mission and they stopped on their way at Deveva 
to give Holy Communion to the founder of the first Deveva community, St. Alexandra. For those who are not familiar with the history of Deveva at all, it is a little bit confusing. Briefly, the first monastic community was established in Deveva in the 18th century by St. Alexandra. The monastic rule was very strict there. With the blessing of the Mother of God, St. Seraphim took some sisters from the old community and founded a new community nearby in 1825. So around 40, 50 years later. Uh, uh, so the first community was founded uh, in the, uh, at the end of the 18th century and St. Seraphim's community was founded in 1825. But some years later, after his death, these two communities became one monastery, and now it is known as St. Seraphim Deveva Monastery. Thus, St. Seraphim, having visited this place only once, guided the community from a distance without going there. The sisters visited reg him regularly in the Sarov monastery or in his hermitage in the forest, where he gave them spiritual guidance as well as provisions, money, and whatever they needed. St. Seraphim had a very close link with the Mother of God, so he said that everything in Deveva was done with her blessing. The Queen of Heaven herself chose this place as one of her domains on earth, and even the plan of the monastery was dictated to him by her. Once she appeared to him and said that she could ask anything he wanted. St. Seraphim said that his biggest wish was that all the sisters of, of his community would be saved. And so the mother of God promised to grant his wish, apart from three, three sisters who would perish. But nobody knew or knows who the sisters were. So the nun who was our guide the last time I visited the monastery explained to us that this promise of the mother of God is very uplifting for them, of course, but at the same time, it keeps them on the alert and it doesn't let them relax because anyone could have the fate of these three poor sisters. As for the teaching, of St. Seraphim. Uh, there are so many that it was very difficult to choose. And of course, the choice is very personal. One of the favorite sayings of St. Seraphim is acquire a peaceful spirit and thousands will be saved around you. But how to acquire this peace? One of the best tools is prayer, trying to hold your tongue not to offend anyone or not be offended by anyone. St. Seraphim also says that peace is acquired through sorrow. He himself was very peaceful and loving. One could say that these were his two main characteristic features. St. Seraphim spoke about silence, which he himself practiced for so many years. He said, I have seen many people being saved through silence, but nobody through talkativeness. He also said that nobody ever repented for their silence. This teaching of his can probably be linked with the acquisition of a peaceful spirit. Father Seraphim also talked about the importance of prayer. People who have truly decided to serve God should exercise remembering God and unceasing prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. For according to St. Isaac the Syrian, it is impossible to come close to God and unite with him without unceasing prayer. This is a good example of how St. Seraphim followed the old patristic tradition and helped to revive it in Russia. Concerning uh, prayer, I would like to add that there is a special set of prayers which is known to every Russian Orthodox Christian from their childhood as St. Seraphim's Prayer Rule, Pravila Serafima Sarovskova. It is an abbreviated version of a prayer rule which he gave to his sisters when they were very busy 
and tired. As a child, I loved it very much and still do now. So instead of the morning or evening prayers, which take about 15 minutes, you read the Our Father three times, then, then Hail Mother of God three times and finish with the creed. So it takes you only about five minutes. So it's very useful when you're in a hurry or tired. St. Seraphim insisted on the importance of joy and was very joyful himself. He used to say, there is no worse and more harmful sin than the spirit of despondency. In order that his sisters did not become despondent, depressed because of fasting or tiredness, he advised them always to have some bread in their pockets when they were at work and also to put some bread under their pillow when they go to bed. In that way, if they suddenly felt sad or hungry, they could eat a bit of bread and get some comfort. He himself used to give little pieces of dry bread as a present to the nuns and all his visitors. Now this tradition is being kept in Diveva. Dry, dried pieces of bread are blessed in an iron pot which belonged to St. Seraphim himself and are distributed to the pilgrims at the monastery. But the culmination and the essence of St. Seraphim teaching is probably revealed in the conversation with Nicholas Matavilov, which the latter wrote down in his memoirs. Matavilov was a young man who met St. Seraphim towards the end of his life. St. Seraphim heal, healed him from a very serious disease. From that time, Matavilov became very close to St. Seraphim and started visiting him regularly. Once they had an amazing conversation in the Sarov forest, where Saint Seraphim explained to him the aim of the Christian life. It is translated into English, and I think it is a must read for all the Orthodox Christians. If you haven't read it already, you can find it in open access on the internet. And I will provide also some links at the end. I will read you out some parts of this conversation so that you can have uh, some taste, taste. It was Thursday, the day was gloomy, the snow laid eight inches deep on the ground and dry crisp snowflakes were falling thickly from the sky when Father Seraphim began his conversation with me in a field adjoining his near hermitage opposite the river Sarovka at the foot of the hill which slopes down to the river bank. He set me on the stump of a tree which he had just felt and he himself squatted opposite me. The Lord has revealed to me, said the great elder, that in your childhood you had the great desire to know the aim of our Christian life and that you continually asked many great spiritual persons about it. I must say that from the age of 12, this thought had constantly troubled me. I had in fact approached many clergy about it, but their answers had not satisfied me. And this was not known to the elder. But no one, continued Father Seraphim, has given you a precise answer. They have said to you, go to church, pray to God, do the commandments of God, do good. That is the aim of the Christian life. Some were even indignant with you for being occupied with profane curiosity and said to you, do not seek, seek things that are beyond you. But they did not speak as they should. And now poor Seraphim will explain to you in what this aim really consists. The true aim of our Christian life consists in the acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. As for fasts and vigils and prayer and almsgiving and every good deed done for Christ's sake, they are only means of acquiring the Holy Spirit of God. Of course, every good deed done from Christ's sake, for Christ's sake gives us the grace of the Holy Spirit. But prayer gives us it most of all, for it was always at hand, so to speak, as an instrument for acquiring the grace of the Spirit. 
For instance, you would like to go to church, but there is no church or the service is over. You would like to give alms to a beggar, but there isn't one, or you have nothing to give. You would like to preserve your virginity, but you have not the strength to do so because of your temperament or because of the violence of the wiles of the enemy, which on account of your human weakness, you cannot withstand. You would like to do some other good deed for Christ's sake, but either you have not the strength or the opportunity is lacking. This certainly does not apply to prayer. Prayer is always possible for everyone, rich and poor, noble and humble, strong and weak, healthy and sick, righteous and sinful. Then St. Seraphim goes on explaining more about what it means to acquire the Holy Spirit. And at a certain moment, they both experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I continue quote, quoting. Then Father Seraphim took me very firmly by the shoulders and said, we're both in the spirit of God now, my son. Why don't you look at me? I replied, I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Father Seraphim said, don't be alarmed, your godliness. Now you yourself have become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, you would not be able to see me as I am. After this word, I glanced at his face and they came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of its midday rays, the face of a man talking to you. You see the movement of his lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice, you feel someone holding your shoulders, yet you do not see his hands, you do not even see yourself or his figure, but only a blinding light spreading far around for several yards and illumining with its glaring sheen both the snow blanket which covered the forest glade and the snowflakes which besprinkled me and the great elder. You can imagine the state I was in. Saint Seraphim asks Nicholas Motovilov to describe what he feels in great detail and Motovilov answers that he feels extraordinary peace, extraordinary joy, extraordinary fragrance, warmth, and sweetness in his heart. And when Nicholas Motovilov says that he's afraid that he may forget this feeling after it finishes, Saint Seraphim assures him that God granted this experience to him, not only for the confirmation of, the, of his faith, but also for the confirmation of the faith of the whole world. Saint Seraphim foresaw his end. On the eve of his day, of his last day, he took Holy Communion, asked forgiveness from all the brethren, and on the following day, he was found without breath in a kneeling position before the icon of the Mother of God. And here you can see the icon the very icon in, in front of which St. Seraphim passed away. Now it is kept at the Moscow Patriarchate. The Diveva Monastery has only its copy. St. Seraphim was canonized by the church in 1903, and there were great celebrations in which Tsar Nicholas II and his family took part. The relics were kept in the Sarov Monastery then. Only 15 years later, in 1920, the relics were taken out of the monastery of Sarov by the Soviet government, and the Diveva monastery was closed in 1927. The churches were desecrated, as well as all the buildings. The sisters were dispersed. But fortunately, some of them survived and managed to keep a number of sacred objects which belonged to the monastery and to Saint Seraphim. One of the sisters even lived to see the reopening of the monastery. In 1991, her name was Nan Margarita 
and there is even a little Russian film about it. I'm not sure whether it has been translated into English, an interview with this sister. Uh, she was also called Frosia in the world. And she met the rival of the relics of Saint Seraphim holding a very special candle. This candle had passed from one generation of the sisters to another for almost 160 years. Initially, it was given to the sisters of Diveva by Saint Seraphim himself with the words, you will meet me in Diveva holding this candle. And so she held this very candle. And uh, here is the procession of the nuns, oh, sorry, uh, yes, or oh, the procession of the nuns in the 19th after the return of the monastery. As for the relics of St. Seraphim, they were discovered in St. Petersburg in the Museum of the History of Religion and Atheism. In the summer of 1991, they were transferred to Diveva in a car procession, accompanied by the Russian Patriarch Alexei and the clergy. It was decided not to take them to the Sarov, to Sarov because it was a closed town by then. There is a nuclear research center there now, and it is still closed. One of the bishops who took part in this journey, which lasted for 10 days, writes that it was breathtaking to see the enthusiasm of the many people who gathered to meet the relics. There were many stops on the way to Diveva, where the relics were brought out of the car for the people to venerate. So on the picture, you can see uh, one of these stops, probably at some village where the relics are brought out and the crowds of people meeting them. But even in the places where the car procession wasn't stop stopping, crowds of people went out and knelt by the side of the road. I myself still regret uh, not having participated in the celebrations then. I was 11 and really wanted to go, but unfortunately my parents couldn't go and obviously I couldn't go <laughs> on my own being a child. However, we went there as a family a couple of years later. Apart from the relics of St. Seraphim, my first impressions of Diveva weren't amazing because the monastery was huge, not organized, still partly in ruins. There were lots of people and the monastery accommodation was in an extremely poor condition. There were about 10 people per room, I think, where we stayed. Then I remember going there in 1994 for the Feast of St. Seraphim in August. It was very festive with the patriarch and many bishops and the accommodation was much better this time already. And now there is a special pilgrimage center through which you can book accommodation to every liking, book excursions at the monastery and organize the whole trip there. Uh, as I said, I will provide some links at the end if you ever want to visit. And this is what the mon monastery looks like now. It has been restored and new buildings are still being built or returned to the monastery. The last time I went was one year and a half ago. We had a wonderful tour with the local nun. It took a six hours and we still felt that we hadn't seen everything. So obviously you need at least a couple of days uh, in order to uh, explore the monastery and to venerate all the relics and to see all the churches and all the holy sites. From the bell tower, uh, yes, and this is the view from, the, uh, from above and here you can see the bell tower. And from the bell tower, you can see the bell tower of the Sarov Monastery, where, where one can't go very far in the distance. I took this picture myself with my phone, hence the poor quality, 
but at least you can have some idea uh, how far Diveva is from Sarov. It, but in order to climb the bell tower, you need to so, to know someone from the monastery and preferably preferably a nun who rings the bells. And so we were very lucky to know <laughs> this nun. And uh, generally speaking, um, uh, to give you some advice, it is good not to visit Diveva on your own. Otherwise, you will feel completely lost because, as I said, it's very big and the nuns are very busy. So it is unlikely they will pay any attention to you. It is better to go with a small group of people and even better to try to find out through your parish if anyone has any connection at the monastery. Then the experience will be much better and more doors can be open <laughs> for you. And uh, here you can see the famous Kanavka a ditch which was dug out with the blessing of Saint Seraphim. It was a special order of the Mother of God to dig it out around the monastery. And Saint Seraphim said that the Virgin Mary herself walked there and that the Kanavka would protect the monastery. And um, one of the pictures, you can see that the sisters on special feast, they decorate the whole Kanavka with flowers. And the Kanaka itself is about, I think, uh, almost a kilometer, 777 meters, exactly. And just imagine it's all covered in flowers. Saint Seraphim was seen himself uh, digging out the Kanaka, even though, as I said, he had visited Diveva only once as a deacon. So one of the sisters, uh, in the 19, at the beginning of the 19th uh, century, saw him digging it out. But then when she rushed to tell the sisters that there is Saint Seraphim himself working, they rushed out and he had disappeared. Only the tools remained on the ground. So it was partly vision, partly true, we don't know. Uh, but there is an icon. Uh, to commemorate this event. It is one of the main, so the Kanavka is one of the main holy sites at the monastery and every evening the nuns walk along the Kanavka in a procession. One can also go on their own at any time of the day. It is a little bit less than a kilometer, as I said. Saint Seraphim said that it would be very beneficial if people went along the Kanavka saying Hail Mother of God 150 times. He said that the result will be the same as if one had been to the Holy Mountain, Jerusalem and Kiev all at the same time. The sisters say that among other things, it is a wonderful introduction to prayer for those who come as tourists and have never prayed and don't know any prayers by heart. So they buy a little prayer book and read Hail Mother of God while walking along the Kanavka. And by the end of the route, they already know this prayer by heart. And today I spoke on the phone to the nun and I know from Diveva to gather some more information uh, before the talk and asked her to tell me some interesting story. And the story, she told me was connected with the Kanavka. First of all, the Kanavka was um, filled in during the Soviet times. So in the 90s, it had to be rediscovered and a whole research institute worked on this project. So the director of this institute, a professor and a very rational man, shared the following story. After they finished working on the Kanavka and they worked for some years in, uh, uh, rediscovering it, he saw somebody who came, a disabled man with crutches, who came uh, to walk, to crawl on this Kanavka. But the Kanavka was closing because it was the night time and the sisters usually close it during the night time. But this professor, being the head of this project, 
asked the nuns to let this man go. And so they let him go. And so he started, he, he left the crutches and he started crawling on the kanavka. He couldn't walk. And then at the end, this professor saw him stand up and walk by himself. And he talked to him and this disabled man had sa said that he had a very serious illness and there was no hope for him to ever walk again. And so this miracle happened in front of, of, the, of uh, the eyes of this man. And it's just one of the many, many miracles that still happen at Diveva. The monastery is beautiful in winter, but probably the best time to visit it is during summer because you can do more things such as going on long walks and swimming in holy springs. The feast of St. Seraphim is celebrated twice on the 15th of January and on the 1st of August. The atmosphere is very festive and blessed, but the monastery is crowded. The nuns are very busy and you may have to spend a lot of time queuing. There are a lot of holy springs around the monastery, uh, more than four at least. Uh, and the water is freezing cold, not just in winter. You see, I really love uh, pictures in winter, so I, I'm sharing them with you, but of course it's better to swim in the summer, but in the summer the water is still really, really cold, but it is an amazing experience for both body and spirit. Sometimes it takes you half an hour to gather all the courage to go in just for two seconds. In my opinion, the best holy spring, if one may say so, is the spring of St. Seraphim. And you, this is the picture of this spring because it's very, it's the biggest and you can even attempt to swim there. And it is also situated very near the area where one of St. Seraphim hermitages was. So you can get a feeling of the place and enjoy the landscape. At the monastery, you can also venerate the relics of the holy nuns of Diveva, Alexandra, Martha, and Elena, as well as the relics of the holy fools or fools for Christ who lived in Diveva. But the history of Diveva monastery in all uh, its saints uh, is a different chapter, which is impossible to cover here. Next to one of the churches, a, there is a grave of Nicholas Motavilla, with whom St. Seraphim had spoken about the aim of the Christian life. During the Soviet times, obviously his grave was destroyed. And the only thing to mark his grave was the birch that had been planted on his grave. So people, even in Soviet times, people still gathered at this birch to say prayers. And it really irritated the local Soviet authorities. And so they decided to dig it out. An excavator arrived and, is, and as it inserted the bucket into the earth, the arm of its bucket broke, which was very strange. And the driver got very scared and said he would not continue the work. So the birch tree remained there, as well as the bucket buried in the earth. And, the, and uh, it helped then to discover Motovilov's grave after the Soviet times. And you can see this birch tree on the picture. And when you are there, you can even see some part of the um, bucket sticking out of the ground. But of course, Mm, yes, uh, also there is a, the monastery, there is uh, an old house uh, where the last fool of Christ, Pasha of Sarov, lived. And now it is a museum. And among other things, it also has some objects that belong to St. Seraphim, like his cross, his prayer book, his glasses, which uh, most of these things had been kept by Nun Margarita who I talked about uh, earlier. 
But of course, the main holy object is the relics of St. Seraphim himself, which rest in the Trinity Cathedral. You can see that even on a usual day, there is a queue to venerate the saint. And I would like to finish my presentation with the words of St. Seraphim, inviting everyone to come to Diveva if you ever have a chance. When I'm dead, come to me at my grave, and the more often the better. Whatever is in your soul, whatever may have happened to you, come to me as when I was alive, and kneeling on the ground, cast all your bitterness upon my grave. Tell me everything, and I shall listen to you, and all the bitterness will fly away from you. And as you spoke to me when I was alive, do so now, for I am living and I shall be forever. So this is the end of the presentation. And if we have a little bit of time, maybe I can try sharing the video of the monastery. But I first have to ask uh, Margaret's opinion. <laughs> Yes, please. We have time. Okay. If it works. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's pray to St. Seraphim. Okay. Mm. No, it's not sharing at the moment, yes. Just one more try.
Right. Oh, I don't know what to say. That was so wonderful. Um, such a wonderful overview of um, Saint Seraphim. I feel like I did meet him a little and um, that I also um, uh, met uh, the nuns of Deveyevo. Um, so thank you so much. Um, lots of people saying thank you in the chat um, and for, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you so much for persevering despite the technical <laughs> difficulties. We have, don't worry, it's fine. Um, we have got um, a comment which um, Sister Nina made um, and she said, as far as we know, the first church of St. Seraphim after his canonization was built in the eastern part of Georgia. Uh, I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong. The city of Dedoplistskoro in um, 1903. So almost immediately after his canonization. Um, but I found it really interesting that, you know, he had these two um, incredible big um, gathering of people together um, for his canonization and then for the translation of his relics from St. Petersburg back to Divieva. Um, was it sort of well known? Um, I mean, I know you said you regret that you weren't able to go yourself in 1991, but was it well known among the people that this was happening? And were there really such crowds all along the, the way? Yes, it, it was very well known. And, um, the, you know, the beginning of the 90s, there was a really, really uplifting spirit because uh, everything connected with religion was forbidden and even being a child I still remember this amazing feeling that now you can go on a cross procession now you can uh, celebrate the canonization and I think it was the feeling that people could express their faith with um, uh, so freely and uh, just as an example you know, somebody remembers also from the translation of the relics now in 1991, that when they were transferred, because first they were found in St. Petersburg, then they were transferred to Moscow, and this car procession went from Moscow to Divieva. But from St. Petersburg to Moscow, they went by train, and nobody, and there was no information in the media about it. But where as they were leaving St. Petersburg, the whole platform was filled with people. So by the word of mouth, people were learning it. And as the train started uh, set off, all this crowd knelt to say farewell to the saint on the platform. And then and when they arrived to Moscow, again, nobody was informed. People were meeting the, rel the relics. So they were telling each other, you know. Absolutely. Um, and I think it just goes to show what a beloved saint he is um, and always has been. And, you know, I think that um, that feeling that the Sister Margarita kept the kept the relics, the secondary relics, um, his belongings, the candle um, and the, 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 the tree showing uh, Nicholas Mirtovilov's grave all of that kind of goes to show just how important the people felt um, felt about Saint Seraphim. Yes, um, also about, sorry, just to add a little bit about his canonization in 1903, there were amazing memoirs and I read some of them. Uh, and again, the feeling was the same or as if somebody said that, as if he himself was walking in and people then brought out the diseased people, children, and they were waiting for the saint, for the relics to pass in order to be healed. And actually in front of this man, there was little girl who was crunched, uh, well, I don't know, cr cr uh, with a crunched back. And uh, as soon as the relics passed, she stood up and told her mother, my mom, I think I'm well. <laughs> wow. And, and um, I've had a um, comment just to remind people that um, you mentioned about the, the dates of his feasts, just to remind people that um, the, um, the day on the Julian calendar um, is celebrated 13 days after the new style. So um, his new style um, uh, feast was 
on Saturday, just gone the 2nd of January. And it's 2nd of January also um, on the Julian calendar, but that would be on the 15th of um, January to celebrate. So um, just a reminder about that. Um, we also have a question a, a bit about his teaching. I'm going to um, slightly condense and summarise the question, um, which I hope people will forgive me. But he talked about, um, St. Seraphim talked about despondency being the worst and most hateful sin. And you talked about perhaps um, sadness or depression being um, part of that um, despondency. Um, and it's interesting that um, uh, uh, when you translate it into French or Greek, it often refers to a condition that requires support. But we just wonder, um, it was just really about that term despondency. Was, was he really sort of interested in the term or was it more how the nuns and how the people were being, how they were well, this is, acting. Well, this is, this is a very particular word which exists in Russian and in Greek, and I think it's difficult to translate it in, into English. So I use the word depression. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a very good word to use, but it, what it means in Russian is when you're feeling low and spearing feeling spiritually lazy and uninspired mm -hmm. and somehow so th this feeling that that stops you from being productive from doing things from um from being optimistic but of course it's, it's not it's not a um, not a condition that needs treatment yes of course and the treatment in a sense is is the joy and and finding the joy um, uh, that he was talking about. Yes, um, yes, this kind of treatment, but not medical treatment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so someone's asking about, um, you know, getting some of the writings and sayings of St. Seraphim. I know you've got some links and I'm hoping you'll be able to copy and paste them into the chat, um, maybe while I'm asking the next question, because people are really keen to, to read more, which is fantastic. Um, and there's also, um, someone's reminded me, um, uh, the, the chronicles of the um, St. Seraphim de Veyavo Monastery, which um, are available also um, to purchase. It's a very large book um, because the chronicles have so much to say. And Jeannie Knights, who um, kind of organised that project, I think is on the call this evening, which is great. Um, but just um, a reminder really for people to look out for that book as well if they're interested in finding out more particularly um, about the monastery um, uh, and the time since St Seraphim. Um, I'm just looking, oh there's a, there's a sort of a practical, um, oh yes yeah, someone's saying the Chronicles are a long read, as I say it is a big book, big book but informative and full of spiritual nourishment. So um, I'd agree with that. Um, someone's asking a quite practical question, which is, is it possible to send um, to Deveyevo to get some oil from the tomb, um, from the candle um, lamps around the tomb? Is it possible to get that from a distance? Or do you really need to go or know someone there? Mm, well, maybe it is possible, but I think, <laughs> I think it's it's complicated because of the, or not just because it's difficult for, to organize for the nuns, but because the Russian post doesn't work very well and it would take ages. And I don't know whether oil is allowed to be sent from Russia to Europe. So these practical issues may be a hindrance. So it's always much safer just to ask somebody who you know to bring it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can call the pilgrimage center and ask, and I will provide the telephone number of the pilgrimage center. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. It was so great to hear some of the, the practical um, side of being there at Deveyevo, you know, potentially going in summer when things are more open, um, but being aware that if you go at the feast, then of course it's incredibly busy. Um, is it at other times of year, so perhaps not at, at uh, St. Seraphim's Feast, but is it possible um, to quite easily get accommodation to stay there at the monastery at the pilgrimage centre? Yes, it is possible. Probably it's better to book in advance. Somewhere I read that it's good to book a month in, in advance 
uh, at least. I myself have never stayed, uh, well, I mean, I stayed at the monastery accommodation in the 90s, as I mentioned, but recently I always stayed with somebody who had a house there. So I'm not really sure, but from what I read, at least one month in advance, but it shouldn't be difficult. Yes, good. Um, Jeannie has um, put the link about the Chronicles um, in the chat. So um, if you're interested in that book, go to saintsalivepress.com. Okay, um, and someone's asking about the recording. Yes, we will make the recording available on um, the, the fellowship website. Um, I just want to give people another chance just to ask any other questions. I can't see any, but there've been so many comments in the chat, I may have missed something. So please feel free at this moment to, to uh, click and uh, ask something. Um, I wondered about the size of the community there at Devevo. Um, we saw some pictures from the early 20th century with some of the nuns there, and obviously some pictures of the nuns um, uh, more recently, but what are the sort of overall numbers that we're talking about in from pre-revolution and now? Well, in the pre-revolutionary times, but it was already after the death of Saint Seraphim, yes. of course. Um, so in the beginning of the 20th century, there were around 1,600 nuns, and it was one of the hugest monasteries. Oh. Now there are about 500 sisters, which is, well, for nowadays Russia, it is very big. But some of the sisters, well, sisters include nuns, novices, everybody. But some of them don't actually live on the site. Some of them are in different skids, so little uh, foundations which belong to the monastery, little like mini monasteries, mm -hmm. I would say. So on it on the site itself, there are about probably about three hundred. Yes, still very big. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, oh, by the way, because there are skits and Padvorya, some churches that belong to to the monastery, there is actually Padvorya of the, the Diveva Monastery in Moscow. So maybe if somebody wants something from Diveva, maybe it's you more useful to ask first at the Padvoria in Moscow. I mean, if somebody from abroad wants anything brought and because from Moscow, obviously it's easier to organize it, to, ha to, to have it delivered somewhere. Yes. Um, Joanna has asked about the Holy Spring that you showed, the, the biggest one where you can actually swim if you're brave enough. Um, and I think you said it was um, next to a hermitage um, that St. Seraphim had. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. And, and did he, did, what, is it somehow blessed? Are there sort of miracles associated healing with, with those springs? Yes, yes. Now, yes, it is St. Seraphim Spring. And um, it is it is called in his name, and it has healing um, uh, qualities. And uh, also, this nun that I know told me, you know how every saint is uh, has its own speciality, has their own speciality. So he, she told me that, for example, in the Diveva monastery, lots of miracles happen. And for example, Saint Seraphim steals marries people so people couples come or sometimes they even don't know each other and they get to know each other at the monastery and then they get married <laughs> but some people also conceive children but she said but this is more to do with the holy spring <laughs> so for example if somebody wants to conceive and can't so this holy spring may help also i read some stories how um somebody who had um, who didn't see well and they swam in the spring and then and then they saw really well so very very practical things I think yes. I think th this is why St. Seraphim is also wonderful because he of course I mean he talked about the essence of the uh, Christian life but at the same time he was helping even during the life um, uh, or uh, even Oh, for needs of the people. So there is a story how a man comes really worried because he lost his horse and St. Seraphim tells him where to look for this horse. So 
So I think it's very nice. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, we've got, a, everyone's asking questions now, which is great. Um, other sisterhood, um, do they have any particular work that they do um, over and above um, working to keep the monastery going? Do they um, have um, outreach <laughs> oh, well, to the community or, I mean, they're very, you said they're very busy. Well, there is, there is a whole list of the duties that I have in front of me and they, so, so I don't know if you can see, so this is the list of their duties and even, and it goes on another page. I have this document provide also this none provided me so they sing they um they saw they uh paint icons they bake prospera they make candles they ah uh, they have a little because it's so so big they have a little clear um, like clinic like not, not a hospital but something like that for first needs on the side of the monastery so there are some sisters who are doctors there uh so librarians uh those who work at the pilgrimage center at the museum um also there is a service of um just social help um, also, some people work, or some sisters work with flowers to decorate all, all the icons and the, um, the shrine and the kanafka and, yeah. and the garden also to, to look after the garden. It's, it's, it's really, really neatly uh, kept. Yes, I thought the, the picture of the kanafka with all the flowers, I was absolutely astonished that that had all been done um, for the feast. It was incredible, um, looked absolutely beautiful. Um, we've had a question about uh, um, the letter that St. Seraphim wrote that was passed down to um, St. Nicholas, the, um, the Tsar, the Royal Martyr, um, and uh, whether you can say a little about that. And also David Gilchrist has reminded um, us that Empress Alexandra went to the um, Holy Spring um, and conceived um, Sarevich Alexei. So um, mm. that's a, that goes to what you were saying before. But do, can you tell us a little about the letter, um, if you have um, information about that? The letter that Saint Seraphim passed to to Nicholas the Second. Yes. No, unfortunately, I'm not aware of it. I only am aware, and I don't know whether maybe there was this occasion. I, I I'm not an expert on St. Seraphim's life. Unfortunately, now after ha having prepared for this presentation, I would like to become. But oh, the things that I know um, is that, uh, the, um, that when there was a canonization, before the canonization of St. Seraphim, that the Holy Synod was against it because it was already very secularized mm -hmm. and it said that there were too many miracles and it seemed quite dodgy for them and also the fact that uh only his bones remained without skin and it put them off so saint seraphim chichagov by then he was a bishop then after that in the soviet times he was killed he gathered all the um uh, documents about St. Seraphim's life and compiled this book, which became this book that Margaret has just mentioned, the Chronicles of Ser Seraphim Divevo Monastery. And he presented this book to the Tsar. And the Tsar read this book and he liked St. Seraphim so much that he uh, and, and, and uh, his wife, Alexandra as well, that they persuaded the Synod so that he that they uh, to accept the canonization of Saint Seraphim. So this is the story that I know about Saint Seraphim and the Tsar. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, when the Tsar was visiting um, Divieva, he visited the full of for Christ Pasha Sarovska. I showed you her house, her wooden yeah. house, and she foretold him. Um, our things about Russia and what awaits him. So I think he went out crying or there was something quite dramatic. I don't remember the exact words and what she told him. So unfortunately, I don't know about them. That's the okay. In the meantime, Harold Ambos has um, 
put in a link in the chat um, so people can read more about the, the prophetic letter. Um, and Miriam mentions that she thinks it's in the book Everyday Saints. So if you have that at home, you can um, look up the story about the letter itself. But that's it's wonderful to hear um, uh, some more about that. We're coming to the end of our time together, um, and I appreciate your joining us from Moscow, so it's getting very late, um, and we thank you for that. Um, I am going to paste one more time, just to remind you our charity donation details, um, and that is if anyone would like to give um, to our two charities, uh, representatives of both of them have been on the call and have thanked us for our uh, donations. Um, I will confirm by email what our final total is um, in due course, but um, please do donate if you are able. Um, and if you would like to submit names for commemoration, please also send those um, to ofsjbevents at gmail.com. Um, Alevtina has put the links into the chat. So um, copy and paste those quickly if you would like um, to do that. I thought it might be nice um, if we um, finish. Well, I'll in invite Alevtina. Is there anything else that, that you would like to, to mention that you haven't had the opportunity to mention um, up to this point? Ooh, well, <laughs> there are so many things. So many. <laughs> I know. Um, yes. In which case, I think it would be nice if we um, conclude with the Kentuckian to St. Seraphim. Um, we sang the um, Traparian um, earlier, and if we conclude with the Kentuckian, and that will conclude this series of our virtual visits. Um, who knows, we may organise another one. England is just, just about to go into another lockdown from tonight. Um, so I think uh, we all appreciate finding out about these wonderful saints and wonderful monasteries and places of pilgrimage. Um, so we may well organize something um, again. So look out for details in due course. Um, but in the meantime, um, I will chant on behalf of us all, I will chant the Kentuckian for St. Seraphim. <clears throat> Having left the beauty of the world and what is corrupt therein, O saint, Thou didst settle in the monastery of Sarov, and having lived there as an angelic life, thou wast for many the way unto salvation. Wherefore Christ hath glorified thee, O Father Seraphim, and hath enriched thee with the gift of healing and miracles. And so we cry to thee, rejoice, O Seraphim, our Holy Father. I'm going to switch back briefly to gallery view. Um, it's been lovely to have so many of you with us. If you've got your camera on, feel free to give everyone a wave. And it's been so lovely to have you. And thank you again to Alev Tina. And uh, we hope to see you again sometime. Stay safe. God bless. Bye, everyone. <laughs>